right, welcome everyone to the alumni career chat about writing, editing, and publishing. We're so glad that you're here. Um, just want to walk you briefly through our panelists that we have here today. We have Kara Riley. Um, again, I believe Brianna will be joining us later. We have Jordan, Tiffany, and Michael. And I'm actually just gonna go ahead and start with the first question and let them introduce themselves. I'm gonna go by in order um, as I see them on the video screen on my computer. So I'm gonna start with Kara. So the first question, if you could introduce yourself, tell us a little bit more about your background, your current organization and your current job, take it away. Sure, uh, so my name is Kara Riley. Uh, I'm an assistant editor at Doubleday, which is an imprint in, under the umbrella of the Knopf Doubleday Group, which is under the even larger umbrella of the Penguin Random House uh, Publishing Group. And so Doubleday publishes um, a mixture of narrative nonfiction and literary and commercial fiction. And some of our big authors that you may have heard of are Colson Whitehead, Margaret Atwood, uh, John Grisham, and David Gran. And so with my current role, um, I support two editors, one who works on all literary fiction and one who works on all narrative fiction or narrative nonfiction. Um, and I myself am acquiring a mixture of literary fiction and narrative nonfiction. Um, and so my job involves a lot of reading. That's either submissions that I have to read and decide whether or not Double J would be the right publisher for. Um, there's a lot of line editing, manuscripts, reaching out to writers and agents, uh, writing rejections, drafting jacket copy, keeping track of all sorts of deadlines. So every day looks a little bit different, which I really like. Fantastic. And did you say uh, what degree you graduated in from the University of Maryland? Oh, sorry, I missed that. Um, so I graduated in 2016 with a double degree in English and Romance Languages. That was Italian and Spanish. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay, next I see Tiffany. Sure. Hi, everyone. So my name is Tiffany Blossom. I am the Communications Coordinator in the Office of Strategic Communications here at University of Maryland. And so in my role as Communications Coordinator, I assist the Chief Communications Officer, and I help develop media briefings for the President and other university leadership. Um, so a lot of my responsibilities include managing the incoming requests that come into the university's communications team, the media inquiries we receive from like top outlets as in CNN, Washington Post, Baltimore Sun, ABC and ABC News and things like that. So yeah, um, and if I missed my year, I graduated in the spring 2018. Um, I majored in communications and minored in business innovation and entrepreneurship in Smith School. Wonderful, thank you, Jordan. Hi everybody, I'm Jordan Aronson. I graduated in 2016 as an English and American Studies double major with a creative writing minor. And I, like Kara, also work at Penguin Random House, but for the Penguin Publishing Group, which is another division under the umbrella of PRH. I am an assistant marketing manager for the corporate team. So when I first joined PRH, I actually worked for a specific imprint, Putnam, which published books that you may have heard of, like Where the Crawdads Sing by um, Delia Owens or The Immortalist by Chloe Benjamin. And then last summer, I actually moved to the corporate team where my job changed quite a bit. And it's a little hard to explain because I do take on a lot of random projects, but some of the highlights are, I manage the Penguin USA social media channels, I attend comic cons around the country to sell books and work on author events. Obviously those are on hold sadly right now because of the pandemic, but in normal times, that's something I do. I help with advertising campaigns, um, company-wide initiatives. I work on the Penguin website. I work with a lot of the individual marketing teams to help make sure that we're promoting all of the books from across our division that we can be. And yeah, that's kind of some of the highlights. Okay, next we have Michael. Hi, uh, so I graduated in 2003 with an English um, creative writing degree. I'm now a content strategist at MRM, which is a large marketing agency. Um, so MRM, um, at least my division, mostly does business to business marketing. So helping really large tech companies sell to other really large companies usually. Uh, and as a content strategist what i do is some days i'm actually writing assets um, like uh, a flyer or a web page and then other days i'm sitting with the client and i'm helping them figure out how to get the ear of the audience they want sometimes they think they really need to write 
an enormous paper and what they really need is an infographic. So I'm sort of helping them understand their audience and uh, create the right material. Wonderful, thank you. And I think we have Brianna with us now. Yes, I do. Hi guys. Sorry, I'm a little late. My name is Brianna Head. I graduated in 2015 from University of Maryland with a degree in general communications. I spent the last almost 10 years working at the Library of Congress as a public affairs coordinator, but now I am a writer editor for federal student aid. So if you have student loans, that's where I work. <laughs> and um, I work on the internal communications team. Wonderful, thank you all so much for your intros. Um, you may have seen Kevin type into the chat. If you think of questions throughout the panel, please go ahead and type them into the chat, direct them directly to Kevin. That would be great so he can see them all coming in and group them together. And we'll get to those towards the end. I have a few more questions I'm gonna ask our panelists and then we'll move on to audience questions. So my next question, and any of you can jump in, we don't have to, I'm not gonna call on you for this. So just feel free to unmute and answer whenever you have um, a good response to it. My next question is, how can students best prepare themselves to enter the part of the field that you're in? Um, are there professional associations they should join? Internships? How can they best position themselves um, to really be marketable? Um, I can okay. jump in on this one. Oh, sorry, Brianna, you go ahead. You go ahead. Okay. Um, I would say definitely get in as many internships as possible. When I was in school, I probably had maybe a total of eight. I'm not saying you have to do that many, but I was, I'm a little indecisive. So I wanted to do one and dive one, try different things, but definitely get out there and um, uh, do internships and network because you never know after school that could end up being your job. So for example, I shared, I was at the Library of Congress. So I worked at the library throughout my entire career at Maryland. And then after I graduated, I had a job. So um, that, that worked out great. So definitely do that. Um, I also was a part of a lot of organizations on campus. So there are a lot of different organizations on campus that you can get involved in because um, you never know who knows who. So those are the two things that definitely helped me. Do you mind sharing some of those organizations? Um. Yeah, sure. So I was in... Um, PRSA, which is Public Relations Society of America. Yes. Yeah, I think I said it right. Um, so I was in that. I was also involved um, volunteering like with the Black Student Union. I also ran for the Student Council. So I did a, little a lot of different things. I also was involved with the radio station at, at school. So um, I did some work there. So like I said, I was a little indecisive, so I was all over the place, but definitely being involved in those different organizations on campus helped. Wonderful. And I would throw the Diamondback out there as well. Um, the Diamondback can be a great way to pick up some really nice examples of your writing. Perfect. Thank you so much. And just to jump on that, I was going to emphasize the internship thing myself because I wanted to say that Though obviously the pandemic has turned our lives upside down, it's also presented a unique opportunity for students to be applying to internships in cities where they wouldn't necessarily be able to be in normally. So Penguin Random House, for example, does take interns every semester. And usually those internships are in person. So often we're recruiting students from local universities and having them come into the office. But now that everything is remote, our internships are actually remote. So you have the opportunity to apply to many of those while you're still in Maryland or you know wherever you are. So that's definitely something to consider. And I was also going to say, I didn't really know what I was interested in doing after college my senior year. And I ended up applying for an internship at Island Press, which is a small publishing house in DC. And that was actually kind of what sparked my interest initially in the publishing field and kind of drove my career forward. So going off what Brianna said too, once you get your toes into a bunch of different things and try it out, you kind of learn a little bit more about what you want to do. Um, and I'll jump in to be the third to encourage internships, which I'm sure you all already know, but like Jordan said, it is really a good and bad time in a lot of ways, but it's a good time in that a lot of publishers, uh, which, you know, are almost entirely New York based are offering remote internships. And I would even say, so when I was um, at the University of Maryland, I interned at Raman and Littlefield, which was my first, you know, dipping into the waters of publishing and it was very helpful, but um, 
I did notice that a lot of New York publishers sort of wanted New York publishing experience. And so actually after I graduated, I got two paid internships when I moved to the city. So because internships nowadays are thankfully almost entirely paid, it is pretty normal to get a, a paid internship post-grad. So I would totally encourage if if some of you are post-grad or just if that's where you end up, um, an internship is a really great way to just get your foot in the door. And then when positions open up, they do tend to uh, hire from people who have already, you know, been familiarized with, with the job. Um, and I don't know how much this is a possibility right now, but it's also a really, really great experience to work in a bookstore or a library. So similar to the Diamondback adjacent experience, that would be really helpful. I'd like to add to that as well. So my experience is a little different. Um, so I, I knew I wanted to work in Maryland. <laughs> and so I wanted to venture out into whatever department. I wanted to see the different departments that were on campus and figure out which one would be the, right, the correct fit for me. And so um, I took RU286, <laughs> the internship course, and RU386. And so my first internship was with the Office of Emergency Management, which is just slightly off campus, but still part of University of Maryland. And so I worked with the fire marshal in that position, and I was a social media coordinator um, as well. And then for 386, I ended up working at the Nimbrew Cultural Center. So it, um, my focus was with the Black Student Union and things of that nature as well. So basically being able to just see the different departments and um, the organizations on campus, I was able to find out which one I wanted to really venture into. And just being able to network on campus with the different departments, I was able to get where I am now. So being hired out of college, so yeah. I also uh, interned at Roman Littlefield uh, for a little bit right after college, um, but that did not turn into a career for me. And I would say, just don't be discouraged if that happens to you. I'll go out there and get internships because they can be really useful, even if they don't directly lead to your next step. Um, I ended up landscaping and waiting tables um, for years. But while I did that, I started to freelance, which I think is also a potential useful uh, role, like task for people who want to get into writing. Um, there's lots of internet uh, writing jobs out there. Not all are great, but what they can do is allow you to amass some clips because even if your um, academic writing is really beautiful, a lot of professional um, places just want to see that you can show up every day and hit a deadline. And so having a couple clips that show that you can do that can be super valuable um, when you're looking for the, the next move. Wonderful, thank you. And I think Jordan already touched on this a little bit, but I would love to hear how COVID has impacted your organization, um, both, you know, potentially negative ways, but if you are, if there are some positives in terms of remote internship opportunities. So how has COVID impacted your organization and even your specific position? Um, well, I was gonna say yes, definitely a plus for internship and job opportunities in general. There are a lot of new hires at our company that are actually remote working in other cities and that's never really been seen or happened in publishing before. So that's definitely a perk. Obviously we've been working remotely since March and we'll continue to do so for an indefinite period of time. So it's certainly been an adjustment to going from a very like vivacious office space to being home and you know, we're on Zoom all day, we're on WebEx, which is another conference line calls all day, but you don't get that same in-person contact, which I definitely miss, but there's also definitely a nice perk of being home because there's a little bit more flexibility with your work schedule and things like that. So I'd say that there are absolutely positives to it. And I think especially in the job opportunity field, because while publishing definitely took a hit early on, book sales have actually been skyrocketing. Of course, you know, when people are home a lot, what better thing to do than read a book? So sales have really been up, which has been great for us and great morale booster for us. And I think hopefully that's how things will continue. So hopefully that means more job opportunities and more internship opportunities as well. Yeah, I don't have that much else to add to Jordan since we work in the same office. Um, I do definitely miss going into work, although on an extremely rainy and cold and dreary day like this in the city, I am sort of glad to not have to like schlep an hour on the subway. So that's the silver lining. Um, but like Jordan said, we, I think like a lot of companies, we weren't hiring for a couple of months there, but now 
things are open, both full-time positions and uh, internships. And like we said, there are a lot of remote opportunities that really weren't on the table before, but now that we've proved that we can work from home, you, they can't really say no. Yeah, I like to say communications is a really great field to be in. Um, so a lot of my work, like I said, is written. Um, and so I'm just in Google Docs all day, just team tagging with all of my um, colleagues and things like that. So our work can be done remotely. Um, and it's, it's, I think it's more like present than ever um, with the written and verbal communication because we're in a virtual world. And so everything is online. So we're able to do that remotely. And I really, um, I think that's a positive, um, definitely a positive takeaway. Yeah, I agree to piggyback on what Tiffany was saying. So we're at home as well. Um, I work for the federal government. So um, it's a plus for me because I like working home. <laughs> and so I think people are able to see that in my office, what we do, we don't have to be in the office every day. So I'm like, yes, let's remember that um, for later on. But uh, also, I, I do, um, I think Michael had mentioned freelancing. So I also do freelancing on the side. So uh, with COVID-19, there have been a lot of freelancing opportunities, um, especially, um, unfortunately, in the journalistic role, uh, world, there were a lot of um, cuts. So a lot of uh, places had cuts, but they have people are bringing people in for freelance opportunities. So um, if you, you know, look out there and then also uh, it's a website called Upwork where there are a lot of freelance opportunities where things are loaded. So if you just want to dip your toe in it and, um, and see what opportunities are out there, you know, you may get a, a big project that could lead to something down the road, but um, yeah. Yeah, I, I was actually remote before, before uh, COVID and uh, oh, here's my cat. Um, the, um, so working at home was um, pretty comfortable for me, but. And COVID has actually um, like caused no decrease in business. Um, here we are in Zoom, right? All the tech companies are doing super well. And they're, um, so my agency is, was actually hiring recently um, and ended up uh, picking up a couple of freelancers to cover work. Um, and I, I don't see any indication that work's gonna slow down for us, um, which is great. Agencies can be really, uh, fickle, you know, if the the if the client decides that they're going to cut their marketing budget, then you are all like looking for another client, and it can be bad. But um, right now is a good time for technical sort of stuff. Great, and that's a great transition to my next question: Are there opportunities that are available with your organization, be it internship, part time, full time, and how could students find out more about these opportunities? So at least for Penguin Random House, there's actually a job portion of the website. If you just go to penguinrandomhouse.com and scroll to the bottom, there is like a link that you can click to that's job and career opportunities. And they're filtered by internships, entry level, mid level and high level so that you can kind of see what's available. You can see the dates that are listed, the job descriptions, the expectations, things like that, and actually apply right from there. So that's kind of how you can find them for me and Kara at least. Mm -hmm. I happen to know there are a lot of uh, entry level like editorial assistant positions open right now. Um, so it's a good time to look. And another resource is Publishers Marketplace. You need a login for some of the things, but they have a job portal that sort of aggregates all of the listings throughout publishing so that you don't have to go to a bunch of different, like Simon & Schuster, HarperCollins, every house has their own jobs portal. So you can go there directly, um, but Publishers Marketplace will also have listings from literary agencies or scouting agencies. Um, so it's a really good place to check. And there's also Media Bistro, which is good. And I'd also recommend following publishers on social media because they'll often post about uh, job openings that they have there. So on Twitter, or Instagram. And one other thing, Carrie, you just reminded me of this too, is if you are applying to a job in publishing, I wish somebody had told this to me when I was applying to jobs in my senior year because publishing moves a lot more quickly than other paths do. So you might hear from friends who are in engineering or business that they're getting hired for positions at the end of the year, like in October, like right now. 
but publishing is a lot more rapid pace and they kind of want you to apply when you're ready to start working. So if you are applying for a full-time position and not an internship, I would definitely recommend waiting until you graduate or you're about to graduate so that you would be ready to start working within two weeks to a month. Because I remember I was throwing out applications to things at the same time that my business major friends were. And I was like, they all have jobs. What, like, what does this mean for me? And then I learned that actually it's just because the pace is so different. It works, you know, a totally different way. That is such a good uh, thing to add because I feel like I wasted so much time the fall of my senior year just being like, why, why am I not getting any of these jobs? Well, it's because I hadn't graduated yet, that's all. I think I mentioned this earlier um, about the RE 286 and 386. So um, that is how we hire our interns for my office in particular. Um, and so we have two great social media interns right now um, and they're doing a magnificent job. And, and so, you can just apply through that course if you take that as well to join, so yeah. <laughs> I can't remember who mentioned um, social media, but definitely that's how I find out about a lot of things. Um, so I follow uh, publishers, editors, and you name it, I follow them on social media. So yes, they're always posting like job opportunities, internship opportunities on social media so definitely be intentional uh intentional about who you follow on social media especially during this this time in your life because um it could be very beneficial yeah the um i think linkedin is like particularly useful for uh the organizations that i work with and um then so they my company was hiring they're not hiring right now but they're also part of a large conglomerate uh, McCann world group it's a huge um, bunch of agencies and so here's my plug for working for a potentially more boring company because business to business marketing is doing quite well right now and other divisions are uh, doing less well because of covid right business to consumer marketing has taken a hit um because a lot of companies are just cutting their budgets. Um, so if you can you know, find an arts and humanities job with a, a, a boring tech company, you potentially have a, a really stable and um, potentially like a great job, uh, even if it might not you know, sound as cool as working for Penguin Random House. I think that's a really important point is that just think about all the possible places that you could have a career doing writing, editing and publishing. Um, you know, I tried to spotlight a few on our panel here, but there's so many, basically all fields need people who can write and edit, right? So um, thank you all so much. Those are the, the kind of the official questions I wanted to start with. I, I do have a few more that I can ask, but I want to turn it over to Kevin to see the types of questions that we have had coming in through the chat. So Kevin, feel free to take it away. Yeah, thanks, Kate. Um, yeah, so have a number of good questions uh, that have come in from students. And so uh, I think the first one I want to touch on is from uh, Allison Vo. And so Allison asked, uh, was there something that you weren't prepared for uh, going into your job and that you had to learn along the way that you'd like to highlight? That's a good one. I'm trying to think. <laughs> um, I think for me, I wasn't prepared. This is, it's not more so career-wise, but just life-wise, just transitioning out of the college life into the professional world and the time management of that, just because my level of responsibility as a student, a full-time student, was a little bit different once I graduated. So um, depending on what your situation is, um, just be prepared for that transition um, if your level of responsibilities are, are going to change and you're um, going to be working full time as well. I also think there's a big learning curve just with any company learning the internal tools that you'll be using at a company, which definitely came as a big surprise to me. Obviously, when I started my job, I knew, you know, logistically what I was getting myself into, but you don't realize how much you have to learn just about where the copier is, where the bathroom is, how to search titles in our title management tool, like small things like that. But the nice thing is that 
obviously that's expected of any new hire and there are always going to be people there who support you and show you how to do those things so you learn eventually but I definitely don't think I realized when I first joined the working force how many small details there were to pick up on. Are there any along those lines, are there any tech yeah, tools um, in your fields that you think it's important for students to learn maybe through internships? So tools that are specific to publishing or social media management, those types of things. I, I would say Photoshop is actually a big one if you're looking more in the marketing realm of publishing. That was something that I didn't really have experience with when I first started, but I learned it while working at PRH. I was very lucky that people at the company actually took the time to teach me how to use the tool. And I think that that would definitely go a long way in a lot of different career paths at Penguin. So that's really the only one that comes to mind for me though. Yeah, I can't think of any specific tools for me. I mean, there's, this is a hard question because there's so much that you don't know when you're starting, right? Um, but for me, I think the hardest thing to catch up on was the sort of like institutional knowledge that people had, um, not even of the specific place that you're working at, but just of the book world in general. And I feel like I, it took me a lot of time to catch up with that. And so one small thing that I could recommend is um, there's this like website called Literary Hub and they send a newsletter out every day or you can sign up to get it once a week. That's sort of an aggregate of news across the like book and publishing and magazine world. Um, and that can just help you familiarize yourself if you're interested in working and publishing with some of the, the outlets and authors and, and names that you'll be hearing a lot. I'd say for communications, um, to really inform yourself with just Google Suite. <laughs> so like analytics, docs, forms, sheets, all of those types of things. Um, for me, I use sheets on a daily basis um, just to track like our projects. So even like project managers, we also use um, a program called Asana, if you've heard of that. And also for so the social media side, of course, Hootsuite and things of that nature. So just to familiar familiarize yourself with those would be good. <laughs> Yeah, um, and if you if you can get experience with a content management system, the the, the um, programs that run sort of behind the scenes of all these like websites and all sorts of other stuff, um, there's a variety of them that's just going to be useful across almost any kind of writing um, or publishing job, I would think. And then uh, along those same lines, if you understand statistics and visualization, like data visualization that's a really useful skill set to combine with writing. Um, so you could probably take that in a lot of different directions. Yeah, I second all that. Um, definitely, I just had to learn Asana, so that was fun. But um, Photoshop, I, I actually had to take a class to learn that just because I wanted to sort of elevate my positioning in the job market. So um, definitely Photoshop. Uh, if you want to dabble in graphics, but don't want to go all the way, I also learned how to use Canva. If you've never heard of that, that's a great, good tool to know. Um, and then also um, AP. So depending on where you work, um, the different like writing styles. So everywhere I've worked, they've used AP writing guidelines. And so staying up on top of that. So I've signed up for like the AP newsletter. So where they send like when there's an update to like the writing styles and things of that nature. Um, luckily where I worked at, they had a seat so I can like go in and like, um, have access to like the, the actual AP book. So let me actually have it right here, the style book. So, um, I have to pay for it myself, but if you want to invest in that, I think that's a great tool, but definitely know, um, the different like writing styles. Um, but I think AP is kind of well known, so. All right, Kevin, do we have some other questions? Uh, yes, yes. So let's see, the next question uh, is from Gabriela Melendez. Uh, and Gabriela's question is, um, does having a graduate degree make a difference in your field? No, <laughs> not, not in my particular uh, corner, uh, it does not. It's, uh, there, it does help to have experience, um, you got a lot of um, externalists and stuff, but a graduate degree isn't useful, particularly. I'd also say no from my corner. 
and mine too. Yeah, I'd say no as well. Um, <laughs> I definitely think it's important to have the experience though. That's what really comes, the years of experience as well. So you'll be able to get entry level and on up, so yeah. Yep, and I would second all of those motions. Uh, no, I do have one, but I, it really doesn't make a difference. As a follow-up question to that, especially for the two of you working in publishing, did either of you go through a publishing institute, for example, the Denver Pub Publishing Institute, or have you known people who have gone through it? Is that a good way to break into the field? So actually, Kara and I did the Columbia Publishing course together, and we were roommates, which is how we became friends and ultimately colleagues later. But we both did that program the summer after we graduated. And like you said, there's another course in Denver and there's one at NYU and there might be another one, but I'm not quite sure. And I will say it's a it's great a way. Yes, course. yes. Um, I will say it's a great way to introduce yourself to the publishing world because every day you're meeting people from across the industry. You're meeting authors, you're meeting agents, you're meeting marketers, editors, publishers kind of across the board and having the chance to network. Um, and in that case, also uh, easier access to applying for jobs. But I think Kara and I both probably would want to emphasize that it's definitely not necessary in order to break into the publishing world. It's one way of going about it, but there are many other opportunities as well. Yeah, it was, I think it was very useful for me to sort of learn about the different facets of publishing that there are because I sort of thought that there was only editorial and that still ended up being what I wanted to do and what I am doing. But I got my first job at a literary agency and I did not know what a literary agency was before I went to the publishing course. So it was really useful for that. But I will say I do have some sort of mixed feelings about it as I know a lot of people in publishing do. It is a pretty expensive thing to do. And again, I think it's so great that there are now remote internship opportunities. And I think that can be a way to get that knowledge without having to do the course. I definitely agree with that. And I also was going to say too, going back to Kara's previous point, when I interned at Island Press in DC, I was an editorial intern and I was like, I want to be an editor. I want to read literary fiction all the time and edit books. And then when I went to the publishing course and met all of these publicists and marketers, I was like, oh, wait a second. I like to read books, but I don't want to change them. I just want to tell people how much I like them, which helped me realize that marketing was actually a much better path for me. So the course does teach you, like Kara said, about all the different departments that I feel like you wouldn't necessarily know about otherwise, and it helps you kind of show where your other interests might lie. I'm going to ask one more question, and then Kevin, I promise I'll send it back to you. <laughs> Following up on that, I was hoping both of you could just share all the different fields within publishing, because I do think students tend to default to editorial, and obviously that's a great place to be, but what are all of the other jobs you could have um, in the publishing world? Ooh, okay, Jordan, I'll start <laughs> and you can fill in any blanks. Oh, so there's editorial, publicity, publicity, marketing, sales, managing ed, which sounds like editorial, but it's not. That's like, if you love calendars and schedules and keeping everyone on track, that's your managing editor. Um, I'm already losing, oh, oh yeah. foreign rights. Uh, Contracts, right, help me out. <laughs> sub rights, production. Contracts, yeah, legal, design. Yep. There's also a lot of HR yeah, production. opportunities, which I think is something that people mm -hmm. also forget to mention, which, you know, is another great way to kind of break into the industry as well. And going back to the managing mm -hmm. ed thing for just a second, a lot of people do mistake managing editorial for regular editorial, but managing editorial is actually the creation of the physical book itself, nothing to do with the content of the book. And production is also the creation of the book, but also copy editing the book. So there is a little bit more mm -hmm. working on the content itself. And marketing and publicity is obviously promotion of the book, promotion of the authors. Editorial is, of course, editing the books. And then sales, there are so many sales opportunities, selling to different markets, selling different kinds of books, selling for different imprints. So even within mm -hmm. all of our little like sectors, there are tons of like mini opportunities within those larger opportunities. And then as mm -hmm. Kara said too, she worked at a literary agency before um, moving over to Penguin, and that's another big facet of where people who are interested in publishing might pursue careers as well. Mm -hmm. There are also scouting agencies, which still, like, four years into this job, I'm still, like, unclear about not what sure. a scout does. All I know is that they read all the time, and it seems exhausting, but they're, like, very involved in the two major foreign book fairs that happen every year. The Frankfurt one, which we just finished virtually, 
Um, and then there's another one in the spring. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna ask one more follow-up question. I think that's it. I promise I'm sending it back to you, Kevin. I know I keep saying that. I just know these are all the types of questions <laughs> I tend to get in student appointments about publishing. Um, Kara, and I guess Jordan as well, could you just define what a mm -hmm. literary agency is and how are those opportunities potentially different than publish opportunities with a publishing house? Yeah, absolutely. So every author, or almost every author, I should say, has a literary agent. And so they're the ones that sift through manuscripts and find authors, and then they sell the book to the publishing house on the author's behalf and take a commission. Um, and so when you're working with a literary agent, you're doing a lot of reading those incoming submissions, but you're also doing a lot more like business administrative work. So a lot of contracts and payments and royalty statements, things like that. So if you're interested in publishing, but also are very business minded, that's a really good place to be. I found that I was not super business minded um, and wanted to be like, like elbow deep in the manuscript and like working directly with the author on editorial changes and things like that. Um, but like, I would say a lot of, there are some people who don't know about the literary agency side. And so the editorial assistant positions are really competitive, especially right out of college. And so working at a literary agency would get you a foot in the door like it did for me and it'll give you experience to maybe move to a different side if that's what you end up wanting. And I was just gonna say too, um, if you are writing a book and you want somebody at a publishing house, a larger publishing house to read it, generally it is required for there to be a literary agent involved. You can't just submit an mm -hmm. unsolicited manuscript. So a perk of working for a literary agency is definitely access to a lot of the big publishers and meeting all kinds of editors. Thank you, that is so helpful. Those are probably the top three or five questions that I get about publishing. So really happy to have some experts on the call here to share the information. And I'm gonna send it back to you. Of course. Great, um, so I will say we have received uh, a lot of questions and unfortunately I don't think we'll be able to get to all of them. So I'm gonna to try to touch on the ones that will be most relevant for the largest amount of people. Um, but with that said too, I'm sure for all the students who are here, um, if you still have a question after, I'm sure you could reach out to any of the panelists um, to get in touch with them and, and kind of speak more about some of the questions that you might have. Um, but with that being said, the next question that I'd like to touch on is from uh, Gabrielle Turner. Um, and I know uh, Brianna had mentioned Upwork, um, but Gabrielle's question is um, how exactly like, does the process look when you're trying to find uh, freelance jobs in writing? And I know uh, that Michael also spoke about uh, working freelance as well. So I was wondering if you could touch on that a little bit. Um, for me, most of my freelance opportunities have come from relationships. So um, I like to say I'm a professional networker. <laughs> so I'm on LinkedIn all the time. So um, yeah, a lot of my opportunities have come from there, but I have gone on up, um, for example, I mentioned Upwork um, for some freelance opportunities. So like, for example, someone would say they have written a manuscript and is looking for someone to copy edit it. And so, and you would, um, and they have this criteria um, where you will have to like have an application. So whether it's um, an example of something you've copy written or, or a written, um, example or something like that and you would just submit that and then either you get the contract or you don't um, but yeah for me mine is a little different because mine is strictly based off relationships yeah relationships are definitely the best way that I've found to get jobs if you can um, but if you're just starting you don't have those relationships you can go online and you'll have to navigate a few things like um, whether you're going to charge by the hour or by the job. Um, and that depends on, sometimes that's a negotiation with the, the job. Sometimes the job will tell you how they want to pay. Uh, and then you also have to do, a, if you're freelancing, particularly if you're full-time freelancing, it's really a lot of um, self-discipline because you are not going to have taxes taken out of that income. But if you make enough, that they will know that you're making that and you'll have to pay taxes eventually on it. So you got to track that. Um, if you're, you know, charging by the hour, you have to track your hours. There's a number of other things to keep in mind. Um, so it, uh, yeah, I think it's fair to, to start um, by just like Googling what 
uh, a good rate would be. And you don't have to charge the exact rates you find, but you can find a range on there. So you're not totally underselling yourself or really out pricing yourself out of the market. Um, and then you can look for, you know, gigs online and try to you know, get your, dip your toes in with just a couple of them and see how it works. And I have a great example of that, which is sort of based off of winging it and relationships. So at the Library of Congress, we uh, we had like in this in bring your child to work day kind of thing, and I was on the committee for it. And so with that, the past years, it was a little boring. So I'm like, we are the Library of Congress. We need to turn it up. So I found a contact at Scholastic. And so from there, we had like Clifford come and like all these other like different um, Scholastic characters and everything. And from that, um, the person that, that I was working with worked in the marketing department for Scholastic. And so with that, they do these write-ups on um, their external outreach efforts. And so they asked me to do a write-up of the event. And so I did that, I turned it in, they loved it. And from there, they wanted to hire me as a freelancer for um, some of their newsletters. And so I was like, I don't know nothing about freelancing. So like Michael said, I Google and I'm like, how much does the freelancer make? How much do I charge? And so I landed on 50 cents a word and 50 cents adds up, I'll say that. <laughs> so um, so yeah, definitely um, that's, that was just sort of a serendipitous uh, sort of situation where it was based on relationship and then also winging it. Great, thank you so much. Um, so let's see, the next question uh, I'll touch on is from Alexandra Higgins. Uh, and Alexander's question is, what are the advantages and disadvantages of working for a small publisher versus a larger one? It's a great question. I definitely think that there are pros and cons to both of them. Um, interning at a smaller publisher was a really great experience because it's a much more intimate team. It's much easier to learn the complete list of books. It's much easier to have relationships with almost everybody that you're working with. Whereas larger publishers, obviously there's so much going on that you don't necessarily get to be in touch with everything going on at the company. So for example, Kara and I both work at the same company. We see each other, or you know, when we were in person, we would see each other and like hug in the hall and stuff, but our work is completely separate. The things I know about Kara's job and the things she knows about mine are things that we share with each other because we're friends, but it's not information that is shared otherwise. And that's sometimes kind of weird to think about. Like we're at the same company promoting books, but we don't know about each other's books. But to go off of that as well, the perk of a big publishing house is access to such a wide array of books and to so many authors and to so many um, job opportunities that I just don't think are necessarily there for smaller publishers. Um, in a small publishing house often, so for Island Press, for example, I think had like 25 employees total. And a lot of those employees are there kind of in the long haul. So there aren't necessarily job opportunities that open as much, whereas because you know, Penguin Random House and other larger publishers are so large, there is more career growth opportunities and just other jobs in case you have interest in moving around. And I just love having access to so many books. That's definitely a huge perk of a larger house. The books are definitely a big perk. Um, I would say the perks of being at a big house from just like a benefits perspective, like PeerReach has the highest starting salary in the industry, which, you know, is great. Um, we also have really good benefits and, you know, back to the books, um, like three times a year, you get to order like seven books from any imprint from the warehouse. And like that will never not stop being fun or that will never stop being fun. Um, and more from a like editorial and publishing perspective, you do have access to different resources that smaller publishers don't have. So like I have a boss who came from a different house um, and she is so delighted that every book that we make, um, the interior design is done specially for that book as opposed to being like chosen from, uh, you know, a template. And we can do certain jacket effects that other publishers can't necessarily afford. And, you know, this is maybe too nitty gritty, but like we have really good relationships um, with the different printing presses around the country, which they're 
that has been a whole separate thing that was an issue before COVID and now it's even harder and Obama publishing a book that's like almost a thousand pages long um, and crashing it into the fall like also caused some issues there. So um, from that respect, it's really good to work at a big company. And, you know, when the pandemic hit, it was, I think a lot of people were really scared about job security and it, it was comforting to know that we were at a big company that like was in a good position to handle that. Um, I would say perks of being in a smaller company, especially again, from the editorial perspective, I do really admire so many small houses for publishing books that big houses don't always take a chance on. Like the, the like weirder books with more experimental books, um, you'll see Grey Wolf or Grove publishing those when all the big publishers passed. Um, and I love that about them. So I think there are pros and cons to both. And like Jordan said, when you're working at a smaller place, it is really intimate and maybe more of like a family experience than a bit of more of a corporate one. Great, thank you so much for your insights. Um, let's see, the next question I'll touch on is uh, from Kenyatta Malloy, who actually works in the Career Center. Um, and Kenyatta's question is, uh, what would you suggest for someone who doesn't know where to start with content creation, uh, or maybe they don't feel confident on creating content for specific subject fields? That's a great question. Um, so um, two things, both research and then interviews. If you are able to get a hold of somebody who's an expert in a field, that's the best possible um, solution. If you're in a position like for marketing, the client should um, have somebody, right, who built this product or, uh, um, you know, ran this event or something. And that if you can get on the phone with that expert, um, that's where you get the best information. Um, otherwise, it's just research and um, hopefully, you know, you find ways to go beyond just the Google search, um, whether it's going to Google Scholar for some of the really technical stuff. Um, there's also like sources for statistics on various things that you can access. Um, I think probably a lot of them through the, the university library. So those would be my thoughts on where to start. Definitely, I would agree. Um, I'm, I don't know if you can tell, but I'm all about winging it and things sort of just happen when they're supposed to. But for example, at the Library of Congress, um, I mean, there is a wealth of different subject matters there. And working in the Office of Communication, I had different beats within there. So one of my beats was the, um, the Middle Eastern section in division. And I didn't speak none of those languages. A lot of the subject matters I was not an expert on. And so, um, like Michael said, I, I had to interview sort of my client per se to just get the base knowledge of what the subject matter was about. And then from there, Google is powerful. I Google and then um, I just uh, made it make sense. So for a person like me that really doesn't understand the subject matter, it could be understandable to the audience that I'm communicating to. So um, yeah, I would agree with both of those. Yeah, that reminds me too of advice that my first boss in technical writing gave me, which is you don't have to know everything. You just have to know your topic one level deeper than you're writing about. So if you're writing to the general audience, you don't need to know everything the engineer knows. You just need to know a little bit deeper than the general audience does so that you can translate for them basically. Um, so that should be your goal when you're seeking out that information. It's just go like one layer. Yeah, I'd even say when it comes to, for me, creating content for press releases or advisories and talking points and things like that, it's definitely important to have an expert or someone that you can reach out to and, and vet and interview and just get like, you know, their thoughts on the subject matter um, at that. And also to just research again, just a simple Google search and finding like the, the page of the company or whatever it is, the subject matter is definitely important. So yeah. Great, thank you so much. Um, let's see, we have 
I'm going to try to kind of synthesize some questions that are kind of in the same area. So we've gotten a few questions from folks um, that either, you know, depending on where they are in their college process, they either haven't had internships um, or maybe they've had one. Uh, maybe they're just graduating, but they haven't had an internship or anything like that. So essentially, I think the the question that I'd want to ask out of that is if um, if you know you have that lower level of experience, what would you suggest, um, you know, that these individuals might want to think about whether they're, you know, in the process of applying for something or, or what should they um, look into doing maybe on campus or something like that? As far as um, like the more English side of things is concerned, a really great internship opportunity is actually the UMD Writing Center. I did that internship, I think my sophomore year and then worked at the Writing Center through my senior year. And it's great because you get to put internship experience on your resume and then you get an opportunity to interact with all kinds of students from across campus and help them edit their papers, their resumes, their cover letters. And I find that because of that experience, I actually felt much more confident going into writing my own cover letters and resumes after working on so many with other students. So you're kind of looking to just, if you're still a student and looking to build up some experience, I definitely think the Writing Center is a great opportunity for that. Yeah, sticking with the on campus, I didn't end up working there because I got the job at the Library of Congress, but McKeldin is another great opportunity um, to work there if you're interested in, in books and um, and then just being in that environment, um, I, I would suggest that too. I think I may have mentioned this earlier, but um, in addition to maybe working at McKeldin, uh, working at the bookstore on campus would also be uh, a really good experience. And like I said, it's, it's never really too late for an internship. So if you're applying for full-time jobs, you can still apply for paid internships. Um, Great, thank you all. Um, and so I think uh, a good question as kind of like a follow-up on that that we've also received uh, from Caitlin Wagner um, is if, if a person has, you know, a degree of professional experience already, you know, um, I think Caitlin might be a graduate student, um, you know, if they are stepping into, you know, the, the world of writing, editing, publishing, what are some skills that are like highly sought after um, from folks that might have some more experience and, you know, how might that apply to something like a resume or cover letter? So this isn't necessarily an answer directly related to skills or like something like that, but I think something that stands out a lot about candidates when they're applying to jobs in publishing is when they make a point to know the structure of the company a little bit. I always think it's very impressive if somebody's applying for a job at the Penguin Publishing Group that they know what kinds of books we're working on as opposed to maybe the books that CARE is working on or other divisions of the company. And I think oftentimes when people ap apply to publishing, we all are sending in these applications like, I love to read. I've been a reader my whole life. I'm an English major and that's fantastic. I love a reader. I love an English major. I am one of those people, but I think doing the research to show that you understand what makes this position in this specific imprint or division versus another really stands out to people because we do get so many applications that have those same similarities and crossovers. I would definitely agree with that. And um, a way to sort of familiarize yourself with the different imprints is again, social media and just looking at your bookshelf and looking at the, the imprint on the spine will tell you who the publisher is. Um, and in terms of skills, I think it's really important to know what kinds of books you like to read, what sorts of genres that you're interested in, because that that's experience right there, even if it's not work experience. To work with books, you have to read them and like familiarize yourself with them. So knowing what you like and being opinionated about what you read is especially important for editorial and, and organized, but that's for most jobs. <laughs> And going off of Kara's point too, I think also something to note is when you do start working in publishing, 
you flexibility is definitely a huge factor here too, just because when you're starting out too, you might not necessarily be working on all of the books that you want to be working on because when you start things off, you might be marketing or editing smaller books or books that you wouldn't necessarily choose for yourself. But like Kara said, as you learn more about yourself as a reader and what your interests are, you can definitely veer your career in that direction as you move forward and you still learn a ton from working on the books that aren't necessarily the ones that make you the most excited. Yeah. And if Caitlin, if you or if any of the any of you are willing to cast your net widely, I would say a really useful skill might be the ones you already have that aren't your writing skills. So if you, for instance, are just a big um, like a space nerd, you're really into physics and outer space science and stuff. There's a, you know, astrophysicist, they definitely have a newsletter. Somebody's writing that, right? There's always these writing jobs at these places. So if you can show you're not just a writer, but you're also um, really passionate about anything, you know, skateboarding or whatever, you can combine those two things and go seek out jobs in that area. I think you'll stand out from um, others. All right, I think that is excellent advice that you've all shared. I really appreciate you spending your Friday with us and sharing this insight. Um, I think one other follow-up question would just be, are you all open to students following up if they have additional questions? What's the best way to, for them to reach out to you? Is it on LinkedIn? I think I've connected with most of you on LinkedIn, but how does that sound to all of you? I'm yeah. absolutely open, yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and LinkedIn is best for me personally. <laughs> Okay, perfect. And I think some of you are in like our Arts and Humanities LinkedIn group, our English LinkedIn group, Com LinkedIn group, places like that as well. Great. All right, I'm going to share one final slide here. Um, just of what this is about. Make it, here we go. Um, so to for the students in the audience, just a reminder that we have these great vault um, e-guide books. Um, or ebooks on different topics, different career fields. So there's one on writing and editing, there's one on book publishing that would be very relevant to what you heard about today. I put the short links up there, um, but it will really walk you through job titles, salary information, give you tips for breaking into the field. Um, hopefully a lot of it will sound pretty similar, or pretty familiar after the panel today, but I think it would be a great way to go a little bit deeper into these career fields if you wanna learn more. You are always uh, able to make a career advising appointment through Careers for Terps, either with myself or with Kevin or someone in the larger university career center if you want to talk more about your internship or job search. We have two upcoming events you might be interested in as well. Um, Oxford University Press is doing a virtual info session for us on November the 12th. And then National Geographic, we're doing a virtual career shuttle uh, info session with them. You can learn all about opportunities uh, throughout the National Geographic organization and you know, connect it to Disney as well. Um, I also want to put in a plug for the University Career Center. We are expanding our internship opportunities with the University Career Center. Um, Ken Yada, who I asked a question earlier, um, has created the uh, communications and events internship. And then in the spring, there will also be a communications writing internship, I believe. So those will be posted in Careers for Terps. So there are uh, as our panelists mentioned, there are opportunities not only with organizations outside of campus, there are, are also some great um, internship opportunities on campus as well. So if we can give a nice virtual round of applause for all of our panelists for that, sharing their Fridays with us. Thank you. Um, I am going to stop sharing and I'm also going to stop recording. Thank you.